Tonight we are playing Quato, which is uh, Connect 4 on steroids almost. Uh, you are placing pieces on the board uh, that your opponent give you and you're trying to connect uh, four in a row, whether they can be uh, tall, short, round, square, uh, lighter pieces or darker pieces, hollow or solid. So there's a lot of different axes to play, uh, which can make it tricky when you're having a, a serious conversation. But we'll do our best. I'm joined, I'm very lucky to be joined by Dr. Julie Peters. Thank, thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm not going to, I am going to have trouble you know, doing the game. And no, this. no, that's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll take our time and we'll have a good chat. Now, um, the reason you're here today is you're part of Women in Film and Television Victoria, yep. um, which we were lucky enough to have uh, Lauren Simpson previously on the show. Correct. Um, you've worked in the television industry for a long time, a veteran, if you will. Yeah, well, I started in 1971, you know, so, you know, I, I did dye my hair, so, you know, um, <laughs> It's, uh, um, yeah, and television was still black and white in those days. And, and on day one, day one, I worked on the Kamal show, Dragging Cables, and it was Kamal standing in front of a 60-piece life orchestra. I went, wow, this is amazing. I just went, wow. I was a uni dropout at that point, so, you know, as a uni dropout, it felt like, oh, wow, wow, I've really landed on my feet. I guess that would have also, yeah, been sort of a, a crash course in, with live television, and uh, thank you very much. So yeah, the, part of the challenge of this game is uh, you don't get to pick your piece. You have to uh, give it to your opponent, which can often lead to you accidentally giving the wrong thing. But so you're saying you started off um, cable uh, rolling. Um, so what was your sort of progression through the ABC throughout the years? Oh, well, uh, decades, decades, yeah, yeah. pretty well five decades. So, um, so I did the first 35 years in TV pretty well. Um, so I was... Um, uh, uh, in, in that first year, I, I, I did um, I did boom operating, boom operating on on drama and kids shows. I did a fair bit of cable dragging. I, I was a camera operator. I was, did, I was a vision mixer for quite a few years. My most extreme vision mixing was golf, forty cameras. <laughs> That's yeah, logistical nightmare. It sounds yeah, like. live to air for four days. That's brain spinning. Um, even having a pee break is difficult because you're golf basically. A normal day is 10 hours and then you know, on the last day they just keep playing until somebody wins and that can go forever um, but I, I, I had a good technique because I got to a point where I could look at a, sh a shot in one of the one of the monitors and go oh yeah that's um, that's camera three from the Sydney van on the 14th and the way I did that was I walked the whole golf course and climbed, climbed every camera tower and, and, and saw what the shots they could get so that's uh, so I, I taught myself the shots before I saw them. I guess that that sort of ha having that experience of oh thank you, um, so having that experience of uh, fulfilling different roles in productions. Do you, do you think that that was helpful not only for your career but also just a better understanding of of like the industry and and how yeah. productions are. I, yeah, yeah, totally. I I think in, in our day because I got to do so many different jobs, I feel I learnt how television worked, whereas Sometimes, you, if you end up in, in, a cam, in a camera role only, for example, you know how the camera department works and you don't always quite get how the big picture works. Um, I think what I enjoyed the most towards the end was, um, in, in television production, was being a, a DOP and lighting director on a lot of big shows. You know, like, um, yeah, probably one of the most extreme was taking Countdown Revolution to Chinkapook. Chinkapook is a small town up near Swan Hill has a population of 14, 24, 24 people. Um, we built a huge rock and roll stage and we had 4,000 people turn up. Went live to air via satellite right across Australia. So outside working with the ABC, um, can you tell us a little bit about your, uh, we interested obviously as, as doctor, you've done a, a PhD, can you tell me a little bit about that? You know, I, I sort of happened a little bit by accident. Um, you know, one of the things I did mention earlier was I'm trans, and so, and I was the first trans person, we believe, to transition at the ABC, which I did in 1990. And what I found is, you know, there's a lot of negati negativity in the press about, about trans, and, and what I found is that I was, just by able to speak to people, I was able to, you know, to an extent, demythologize trans. In fact, um, in September, and this, I don't know when this goes to air, but in September I'm doing a show at the Butterfly Club called um, uh, mutton is the new lamb, uh, a trans and gender demythology. And anyway, I was talking to uni students a lot and I got, I said, well, you know, I'm 
chatted to 200 uni students about you know, what trans is about. And I said to, my, to the woman who, are, you know, Maria Pallotta Chiaroli, Dr. Maria Pallotta Chiaroli, uh, she was at Deakin at that time in, um, in, in public health. And I, I said, um, yeah, should I take this, take this further by doing a master's? And she said, oh, no, 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 do a PhD. I knew I was trans from a very young age, but um, I didn't feel I could do it in the 70s or 80s because it would, I, I just didn't feel I could keep a job. 1990, I was able to stay at the ABC. So I basically came out to 700 people. And a few years later, I started writing for the gay press, came out to 20,000 people. And then in 96, I ran for the Australian Democrats for a seat of Batman and for the House of Reps. And basically I came out to 3 million. I went, oh, okay, this seems to work. I can cope with this. And yeah, in those days, I did some bit TV interviews, even in this very studio. Yeah, it's all it's all coming full circle that you're 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 back here and having a, a chat to me, which I appreciate. Um, what you might not appreciate is the the move I'm going to do now. It's going to win, is it? I I am going to place in the row there the four oh, light cool. wooden pieces. Oh, Dan. Um, yeah. But 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 let, but let's so the, that that's that's the game there. Uh, Quarto. Thank you. Um, well, well done. Thank you. So I just want to talk to you a little bit more because you've obviously. Incredible life story, I think. Um, I think you're having uh, very publicly having to sort of announce yourself, and there's obviously might have been some opposition. Um, what would you say to anyone you know who's interested in media now or who uh, is following a similar uh, similar experience? Is there anything, any words of wisdom or anything you might want to say? Uh, well. It's very hard to summarise in a very short yes, time. I but in a way, that's why I wrote a PhD about it, because in a way, the PhD is very much about giving other trans people and their carers strategies for, for, um, yeah, for having a livable life, a life with agency. But the other thing which um, I discovered along the way, because the exception proves the rule, trans, in a way, teaches us how gender works. And so that's why you know, I've um, called my show, at tra uh, my subtitle, at, at trans and gender demythology because, um, and, and this is a bit cheeky, not enough people read my PhD, um, I have to say, yeah. and uh, even though I had over 2,000 downloads, I, and I put lots of pictures in it as well, um, um, so effectively what I'm doing is trying to turn my PhD into a cabaret. Yeah, I, I guess that's probably a little bit more of an accessible way to get into it, because um, I'm sure the PhD is, is a book, um, yeah. which, again, well, it's not the same. I, I know I've got you know cousins who have like written PhDs in like science, and that they, they'll like, here's the bound book. I'm like, I, I'm not going to understand any of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like I like to think I wrote mine pretty yes, well in plain yeah, English, yeah. actually. It's so, just long. It's 110,000 words. <laughs> if people did want to read it or find out more, where where would they want to go? Well, they go to the Deakin website um, and DRO, which is Deakin Research Office, on the website, and it's downloadable for free um, as a PDF. Um, I also then rewrote it as a research monograph, um, very similar name, name rolls off the tongue by the way, a feminist post-transsexual autoethnography on challenging all of gender coercion. Uh, Please don't ask me to read that back. <laughs> okay. So when I transitioned, I, some of the guys at work had, um, you know, a lot more issues than I did. For ex you know, you've got to imagine, this is 1990, I was, you know, um, quick subtraction, I was 30, 33 years cuter than I am now. And um, one of the guys in the canteen stood back and looked me up and down and said, you ought to have transsexual tattooed on your forehead so blokes like me aren't tricked into being poofters. And, and I went, I, I just said, I didn't tell him I was an idiot. I might have even added an expletive, which I won't put, put in right now. And, um, but you know, um, yeah, when you transition, it affects everyone you know. Your family gets stressed. If you're in a relationship, um, yeah, particularly, um, 90s pretty well if you transitioned your partner left you nearly always um, whereas now um, your know, partner sustained which is really great yeah it's good that things have obviously it's not it's not as good as it should be but it is progressing at least yeah Professor Julie Pierce thank you very much for coming down having a chat having a game but all sort of showcasing some of your uh, some fantastic life experiences and very happy to hear them great thank you